from Bloomberg World Headquarters in New York to our TV and radio audiences worldwide. I'm David Weston. Welcome to Balance of Power, where the world of politics meets the world of business. On the brief today, Yelena Sharyatova on the wave of new economic data out for the United States. From Washington, Kevin Cirilli on a new poll showing Elizabeth Warren slipping in the presidential race. And from London, Therese Raphael on Jeremy Corbyn's latest attack on Prime Minister Johnson. So, Yelena, we were together actually earlier today when we had the first round of data come out, which was really for the third quarter, second read in GDP. But now we have new data for October. Where do we stand? Okay, so all this means a slower growth going into the fourth quarter of the year. So personal income and spending report uh, indicated a decelerating trajectory of personal income growth. A little disappointing. Disappointing, absolutely. So if uh, growth in personal spending continues at the same pace, it would imply significant deceleration from 2.9% growth in the third quarter uh, to something like 1.6% in the final quarter of the year, which also implies GDP is not going to be that great in the final quarter of the year. So you're with Bloomberg Economics. What are you projecting right now for the fourth quarter? Because that's sort of the critical question. There's a pretty wide range of what people are projecting. Sure. And uh, some tracking estimates actually suggest that growth will fall below 1%. Right. We don't think so. We think growth will be in the vicinity of 1.7% which will be just enough to uh, keep the projections from the Fed at 2.2% for the year as a whole. But the direction is clearly down. Absolutely. The, the direction is uh, showing deceleration in the main engine of uh, economic activity in consumer spending. Okay, Yelena, thank you so much for being with us. That's Yelena Shiletova. She is senior U.S. economist with Bloomberg Economics. And now we go to Kevin Cerulli down in Washington. So, Kevin, uh, how long ago was it Elizabeth Warren was almost being christened? Now it doesn't look like she's doing quite so well. Precisely. She still remains a top tier candidate uh, in terms of the top four candidates, former Vice President Joe Biden, Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren and South Bend Mayor Pete Buttigieg. But you're absolutely right. A new poll out has her significantly slipping. Uh, you, you look at Biden still being able to maintain his lead uh, really ahead by 10 points against 10 percentage points against Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders still maintaining that according to this new Quinnipiac poll. Then you take a look at the lower tier candidates, Amy Klobuchar, Michael Bloomberg and Kamala Harris. But really good news for Joe Biden. I'm told by sources connected to his campaign that they are fully prepared for a long delegate fight beyond Super Tuesday uh, heading into the convention. Uh, and I also just would tell you that Bernie Sanders' campaign also incredibly confident that they've been able to maintain their ceiling. The question becomes, with Senator Warren slipping, will the Sanders campaign be able to seize off of that support? And another unknown is whether or not South Bend Mayor Pete Buttigieg can expand his support into African-American communities. So far in the past week or so, he's been attacked by his political rivals on that particular front as well. Yeah, and Kevin, it may be a little too soon, but we're getting to the point where we have to go be beyond the nationwide polls and really break it down yep. more. For, for, example, for example, when you talk about the African-American vote, we're talking about, for example, South Carolina. We're not talking about mm -hmm. Iowa. Precisely. South Carolina going to be a crucial, crucial early primary state in terms of where it comes ahead of Super Tuesday, uh, but also right after the Iowa caucus and New Hampshire primary. Joe Biden feels incredibly confident at those South Carolina poll numbers that he will be able to get momentum heading into Super Tuesday, fueled off of a, a strong performance in South Carolina. Meanwhile, uh, in, in terms of the Iowa caucus, Buttigieg uh, really surging to the top of the polls there. And so that would set up New Hampshire to be be an all-out political mud fest, for lack of a better word, here on Thanksgiving Eve. <laughs> a lot to talk about around the Thanksgiving table, or not. Yeah. <laughs> or not. Okay. <laughs> Many thanks to Kevin Cirilli down in Washington. Thank a disclaimer you. now, Michael Bloomberg is, of course, the founder and majority owner of Bloomberg LP. That's the parent company of Bloomberg News. Now we go to London and Therese Raphael in London, because there's a little race going on over there, Therese, that you have going, and it looks like they're really charging and countercharging. Now we have this allegation that maybe the Tories are secretly dealing with the National Health Service? Yeah, so these, as we go into the last two weeks of this race, the uh, you know, game is really to try to find some issue that, uh, you know, that, that turns the tide for one side or the other. So we've had, you know, two days of uh, a real row over anti-Semitism in the Labor Party. And today, Jeremy Corbyn's Labor Party released a trove of documents that they say prove that Boris Johnson wants to sell out the National Health Service uh, to U.S. drug manufacturers. 
jurors. One of the uh, claims is that uh, is that they would agree to shorter patent times, which would then result in an increase in drug prices. As um, uh, uh, sorry, they would uh, have longer patent times, which would result in an increase in drug prices uh, as it took would take longer for generics to come onto the market. So, you know, we've seen both sides now jockeying for position and trying to convince voters that their offer is better and that it would be uh, uh, damaging to the National Health Service to go for the other party. Therese, as you know, here at Bloomberg, we would like to look at the markets as a way maybe of getting into the politics. And when you look at the pound particularly, it seems to be just tracking according to whether the polls indicate Labor's going to win or whether Tories are going to win, but by how much. At the same time, we've got a big poll out overnight tonight. YouGov, is that going to tell us the answer? Well, that's going to be one to watch, and it's because they use a new methodology uh, that was remarkably accurate in 2017 called MRP, and what it does is it takes a much larger sample uh, size, and then it sort of graphs the answers onto the different constituencies. So it gives us the first real picture of how the vote might break down by constituency. In the U.K., because it has a winner-takes-all system by each constituency, that can matter a lot. So that comes out at 10 p.m. at night, and I think traders are going to be watching that closely because it was accurate in 2017. But, uh, you know, polls have been wrong before, and the and YouGov is very careful to say that this is not a, a perfect uh, methodology. And, of course, a lot of these questions were asked before the recent anti-Semitism row really, he, really uh, heated up. Yeah, if you find a perfect methodology, you let us know, all right, Therese? I haven't found it yet. <laughs> Therese Raphael of Bloomberg Opinion reporting from London. And now... We get a check on how the markets are reacting to today's top stories. Joining us now is Abigail Doolittle. I must say, Abigail, when I came in early this morning in the futures, it was all up because of trade. At the same time, now it looks a little more mixed. Well, you know, we had some mixed economic data. You were just talking about those consumer spending uh, and income numbers, a little bit disappointing. The consumer two-thirds of the economy. So if there was any sort of a trend right now, it's sort of a one-off. But if there's any sort of a trend, that could be a worry. On the other hand, durable goods came in a little bit better. Mortgages came in a little bit better. But pending home sales, that's a leading indicator slipped. So a mixed bag there in terms of the economic data. But overall, we're looking at another day of record highs. So it's the day before Thanksgiving. I have to ask, what's the volume like? Because we have to be a little careful about reading these numbers. Yes, yeah, super light. And actually, the gains that we're seeing right now will mix because the Dow is down slightly. Uh, the, the, they're actually slightly larger than I would have expected. Yesterday, it felt like the uh, moves were slightly smaller. But if we close higher, the 26 record close for the S&P 500 in this recent streak, pretty extraordinary. Well, it's worth remembering we are at or close to those records. We yes, keep we are up at. Against the, but the deer affect that, the Dow? Uh, you know, the deer is weighing on the Dow a little bit, their outlook. And that could be a concern because, of course, those big ticket items. Another concern concern could be the VIX, that quote-unquote yep. fear index. It's super low, but some are saying it's complacent. And if you take a look at the VIX curve, which prices out for the future, yeah. it suggests some think that there could be some big volatility ahead in 2020. But right now, it seems like this melt-up is just continuing. Okay, Abigail, thank you so much. That's Abigail Doolittle bringing us up to date on the markets. And now, we turn to Ritika Gupta for Bloomberg First Word News. Thanks, David. The death toll from an earthquake in Albania has now risen to more than two dozen confirmed fatalities. The country's defense ministry confirmed the deaths, adding more than 650 others were injured as a result of yesterday's magnitude 6.4 quake. The country has declared today a day of mourning as rescuers search through the rubble of multiple collapsed buildings where people are still believed to be trapped. The European Union's new boss has pledged major policy changes to address some of the bloc's biggest problems from defence to climate change. Ursula von der Leyen will be the first woman to assume the role of the European Commission president next week. In an interview with Bloomberg today, she said a European defence union could play a complementary role to NATO. Without any question, NATO is the strongest military alliance in the world. Uh, the European Union has a different role. Of course, we have many European member states that are also members uh, in NATO alliance. Um, and as Europeans, I see fields where uh, we do not need NATO, but the European Union is called upon. And, uh, for example, if you remember five years ago in Mali, uh, we, the European Union had the will uh, to answer uh, the crisis and to fight terror, but neither the procedures nor the structures. Therefore, we're building up the European Defense Union since three years, knowing that it will be complementary to NATO. 
von der Leyen has vowed to take a pragmatic approach, pledging to build consensus to pursue policy priorities. And President Trump says talks on a China trade deal are, quote, in the final throes, but he insists he'll hold up an agreement unless it's a good one. The first phase is expected to include Chinese commitments to buy more American farm products. A possible stumbling block is how to roll back tariffs. Former President Jimmy Carter has been released from Emory University Hospital in Atlanta. He had been recuperating from surgery to relieve pressure on his brain caused by bleeding from a fall. A statement from the Carter Center says he will continue to recover at his home in Georgia. Carter needed hip replacement surgery after falling earlier in the year and he fell twice in October, hitting his head at least once. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and at TikTok on Twitter, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. David? Thanks so much, Ritika. Coming up, Turkey with a side of data. There's been a flood of economic data this morning ahead of the holidays. We parsed through it with Douglas Holtz Eakin of the American Action Forum. That's going up next. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. I'm David Weston. This morning, we got a rush of economic data. The U.S. economy expanding 2.1% in the third quarter. That was better than the initially reported 1.9%, while demand for U.S. business equipment unexpectedly increased in October by the most this year. Here to take us through it all is Douglas Holtz Eakin. He's former director of the CBO and current president of the American Action Forum. He's joining us from Washington. So, Douglas, thank you so much for being with us. What did you make of these data? Because when you, I first saw them, the, the third quarter numbers, which is the second read, were encouraging, but then I saw the October numbers, maybe not quite so much. Yeah, no, it, it's a great day when you get a lot of numbers, so um, <laughs> let, let's just sort of walk through them. Uh, I, I think on balance, this is a, a, a good day uh, for economic data, but the GDP got revised in some important places, most notably business fixed investment got revised up a little bit. So did inventories. That's transitory. I wouldn't get carried away with that, but this has been an economy that's been carried by the consumer. Uh, what's been missing is, is some strength out of the business sector. We saw a really good uh, sales number for new homes uh, last, uh, last month, and, and we saw existing home sales up. We've seen a record pace since 2007 for permits and, and starts. So that feeds into the notion that somehow we're going to get residential construction and business uh, fixed investment sort of picking up some of the, the, the load of carrying the economy. That's the good news piece. Uh, and, and as you mentioned, the non-defense capital goods were up quite sharply, 1.2%. You know, I, I think really if you took out the Boeing impact from the, the 737 MAX, this would all look really good. I mean, there would be no downside. So tell us about the curve, because clearly the economy is slowing down somewhat. Certainly we're not up at the 3-4% sure. level. We're slowing down. What does that curve like, look like? Is it leveling out as we go into the fourth quarter? Is it going to come down some, uh, uh, some more? Uh, I think you, you could easily see it uh, tick down some more and, and get a fourth quarter GDP number that looks like, uh, you know, 1.7, 1.6. Um, there's some tracking numbers that, that, are, that are below one, but I think those are too pessimistic. So we are clearly slowing down. Uh, some of that is going to be transitory. I think we'll see some, uh, some of those inventories run off and that'll depress the fourth quarter number a touch. But, but I think on the whole, this economy has been remarkable. Uh, it's had taken you know, the headwinds of the trade uh, wars uh, pretty successfully. It's had a, a big drop off in, in business fixed investment that comes from both confidence and also uncertainty about the supply chains. And, and we're still chugging along at, at roughly 2%. I think that's an accomplishment. And how much of that is an accomplishment that just is because of the consumer as a practical matter? You mentioned earlier this issue. It's really sustained us. Can the consumer keep doing that? Does trade affect that consumer at all on their willingness to open up their pocketbook? Uh, I think the consumer can continue to do this. I mean, let, let, let's look at the reality. Uh, the labor market's doing very, very well. Unemployment is extremely low. Wages are rising. Everyone would like faster real wage growth, and I'm in that camp, but, but we're still getting that, that wage growth. The household sector doesn't have a big problem on its balance sheet. So there's no real reason for the household sector to go south. They can keep chugging along. I don't think it gets affected too much by trade anymore. It's become sort of part of the chatter out there. You hear about it every day. And the, the dollar value of the tariffs, while, while real, isn't enough to stop it. So I, I think the, the household sector is in pretty good shape. We've got to sort of look to the rest to pick it up a bit. 
We're talking with Douglas holtz Eakin. He's the former director of the Congressional Budget Office. So, uh, so Douglas, let's talk about the politics of this for a moment, because we are entering into yeah. next year, uh, an election year. And let's talk specifically about sort of swing states. The New York Times took a look at voters in six battleground states who voted for President Trump uh, in the 2016 election, but actually voted for the Democrat the next time around. And what they conclude basically said, they'll stick with Trump as of right now, even though they voted for a Democrat in the midterm, they'll go back to Trump. Given the nature of the economy, if you're looking at Wisconsin, you're looking at Michigan, you're looking at Pennsylvania, is this economy strong enough for people to stay with Donald Trump? Uh, I, I'm going to give you two answers because, you know, I'm an economist. I can't <laughs> help it. But uh, he, here's the conventional wisdom. Uh, what matters is the economy and its performance three to six months out from the election. So right now isn't important. What's going on next June, say, is important. And if the economy is uh, growing strongly enough, uh, and unemployment remains low enough and wage growth is there, the, then he's going to be in very good shape. B big advantage for an incumbent. In his case, I think it's a, a slightly higher bar because he said a lot about how Obama's economy wasn't satisfactory and an average growth rate of 2% wasn't any good. And so if you're growing at 2% in June, I don't think that looks so great from a political point of view. And so that, that's sort of how the economics of this election line up, at, at least at the moment. The one thing I will say is the caveat. The other story is go talk to the political uh, strategists, the pollsters, the, the people who do those focus groups, and what they will tell you is the economy matters less than ever before, that this election has become extremely tribal, and uh, there's only a couple uh, swing voters out there that, who are going to determine the outcome. Uh, what could drive the economy either up or down as we go into 2020 as a practical matter? I mean, we talked about the investment in, uh, in f fixed assets that over time can increase productivity, but that takes some time. What in the shorter term yeah. could actually affect the economy? Uh, I, I think the downside risks are pretty obvious. They're, they're primarily located in trade. Those are the ones that we can see. Um, we could also see... Uh, you know, the global economy is slowing further. There, there's a lot of weakness out there, and that, that hurts the U.S. Uh, as well. So that's the downside risk. The upside uh, potential really is in residential construction, where, you know, the Fed easing has helped. Strong labor market helps. Uh, there's a, a, a very low inventory. Uh, housing hasn't played its traditional role in the business cycle since the, the Great Recession, but we could be seeing a resurgence of that. That's a, that's a strong upside risk, I think. And the business fixed invest is just the, the ultimate wild card. Uh, you know, the, the large investors, the big multinational companies who have big fixed assets, don't know where to put them. Uh, they don't know if this is the right time to go forward. And I think that's got to get resolved to, to get a really robust recovery. So, so President Trump's answer is a clear answer, which is all up to the Fed. You just got to keep cutting and keep cutting and cu keep cutting. In fairness, they have had some cuts now. Is that affecting either the consumer or the business fixed income, in your estimation? Uh, I think it's had a modest impact on consumers through the traditional channels. We've seen uh, a little bit better uh, housing market, a little bit better durable goods. It's not been dramatic. They were insurance. They weren't first order cuts. And, you know, there was a principled case to be made to not uh, have some of those cuts. So I, I don't think this rests on the Fed. I think the president's mistaken in that. I think the other factors are far more important. Okay, finally, uh, we do have yet another extension of the funding for the U.S. government to the end of December now. Uh, does it really just come down to the wall? Yeah, it, it comes down to the wall. Uh, they, they started, uh, you know, sort of pr praising themselves about getting a deal on the, the division of the overall total funding levels, the so-called 302Bs. The truth is they couldn't get there. It didn't get done before they left because of the wall. Uh, they've got problems with the NDA, the National Defense Authorization Act. That's something that always has been bipartisan. It has happened every year. It's stopped dead because of the wall. So until they figure out how to handle the wall and the ability of the president to move money to build the wall, even when Congress hasn't appropriated it, uh, they're not going to have a deal. Okay, Doug, thank you so much for joining us today. I hope you have a happy Thanksgiving. Thank That's Douglas holtz and He's president of the American Action Forum coming to us from Washington. Still ahead here, the trade war is taking a big toll on deer. It's our company in the crosshairs next. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio.
This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. I'm David Weston. It is time now for the stock of the hour. Deer is the worst performer in the S&P 500 today. Shares dropping about 5% on a disappointing outlook that is partially a result of trade tensions. Canaan Lines is here to tell us all about it. The interesting thing is that the headline was they actually beat by a little bit on their earnings and their revenue, but boy, they didn't get any credit for it. Yeah, so the fourth quarter came in pretty much in line, but we have to remember the bar was a lot lower going in. They've been taking down those estimates because we knew it was probably going to be pretty weak. And we also knew that about the fiscal 2020 forecast, but analysts actually described it as far worse than was expected. I mean, these are deep cuts. They see that for agriculture and turf sales in fiscal 2020, they're going to be down between 5 and 10 percent. And then for construction and forestry, they could fall as much as 15 percent. And their net income forecast also missed by a pretty wide margin. They see just $3.1 billion at the high end. The street was looking for almost $3.5 billion. And one thing that struck me is we tend to think about that in terms of agriculture and what's going on with farmers. We don't think about the construction part, and the construction part is actually down more than the agriculture. Yeah, which is really interesting. Of course, we know farmers, for in large part, have been weak, but a lot of this is just about business investment, yeah. demand for this equipment. The company is putting pretty much direct blame on the ongoing trade war, the uncertainty that it creates both on the tariff front and in terms of macroeconomics. Um, and they actually expect that as a result, uh, agricultural equipment in general, the demand is going to fall about 5% in the U.S. and China in fiscal 2020. And what's so interesting is that this is backed up by USDA data. We actually had that tracked on the Bloomberg terminal. Farmer capital expenditures have fallen 16% since 2017. You're really seeing that reluctance to spend on new equipment. And of course, that's not just a problem for deer. It's a problem for a lot of its agricultural peers. You're seeing Agco and CNH Industries, for example, falling as well. well and you hear stories of farmers going bankrupt. I mean, going mm -hmm. out of business altogether, giving up their Farms is pretty disturbing. At the same time, we got a brand new CEO uh, yes. in charge of it. Uh, back when I was at Disney, ESPN was known for sandbagging their, their budgets. <laughs> they come in really low so they can beat the numbers. Any chance there's a little bit of sandbagging going on here? It's definitely possible. John May, I mean, he literally just took the helm about three weeks ago at the beginning of November. So, yes, there's a chance he's being a bit too conservative. And our analyst at Bloomberg Intelligence actually said they think that's likely. But you can see why exercising some caution is a good idea here, given that you just have no idea what's coming three months, six months a full year down the road, especially in terms of trade. There's still a lot of uncertainty as to whether or not we're going to get to a phase one deal, what that's going to look like, what it's going to look like for agriculture. And in that unclear environment, maybe it is better to hedge uh, a little bit, err on the side of caution. And that said, you also have to consider what happens if the worst case scenario actually does come to fruition. Right. That's likely going to mean Deer needs to do a lot more cost, cut, cost cutting. They might need to restructure. So it could have some pretty right. big implications. And you're seeing that reflected in the stock price today. Great report. Thank you so much, Kaylee. That's true. This is Kaylee Lines from Bloomberg. Up next, Turkey's testing that Russian missile system we've heard about, and the clock is ticking on U.S. sanctions as a result. We talk with retired Brigadier General Mark Kimmett. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on Bloomberg Radio. From New York, this is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. For Bloomberg First Word News, we go now to Ritika Gupta. Thanks, David. Wicked weather across much of the U.S. is disrupting holiday plans on one of the busiest travel days of the year. AAA says 55 million people are expected to hit the roads or fly for the Thanksgiving holiday. But two severe storm systems are creating widespread travel problems. Parts of Colorado have been hit up by a, a foot of snow, causing multiple accidents and treacherous roads. And high winds in New York City are threatening to ground the massive balloons that are a big part of the annual Macy's Thanksgiving Parade. The governor of Massachusetts has signed into law a groundbreaking ban of the sale of flavored tobacco and vaping products, including menthol-flavored items. Anti-smoking groups say the move by Republican Governor Charlie Baker makes Massachusetts the first to enact a permanent statewide ban. In September, Baker declared a statewide public health emergency and ordered a temporary halt on the sale of all vaping products. The Trump administration may strike back at France. The French plan to slap a new digital tax on large American tech companies. Now the U.S. is considering whether to retaliate with tariffs. The U.S. Trade Representative's office is investigating the matter. It will announce its findings on Monday. 
The Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons agreed today to ban Novichok nerve agents. Novichok was developed by the Soviet Union during the Cold War. It rose to infamy when it was used in the attempted assassination in March 2018 of Russian spy-turned double agent Sergei Skripal. It's the first time the global chemical weapons watchdog is updating its list of banned substances. Global News, 24 hours a day, on air and at TikTok on Twitter, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. David? Thanks very much, Ritika. The U.S. warned Turkey not to buy a new missile defense system from Russia, but President Erdogan went ahead anyway. And now it's taken delivery and started testing. Mark Kimmett is a retired U.S. Army Brigadier General, former Assistant Secretary of Defense for military, Political Military Affairs, and former Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for the Middle East. He comes to us today from Washington. Welcome, Mark. It's great to have you back with us. Hi, Let, David. Let's start with the national security implications of this. Why is the United States, and for that matter, perhaps Western Europe more generally, so concerned about this S-400 system? Well, it's the radars, primarily. The radars have a capability to look well into any part of Europe and look at the aircraft that are flying. Most importantly, those that are part of the F-35 consortium, we have grave concerns that that radar can start taking apart the stealth profile. So this is a capability that the Turks have, uh, which we expect the Russians to put a back door on, that would in many ways make it very, very difficult for us to maintain the air superiority of the F-35. So Turkey, of course, is a part of NATO, is in an ally as a part of NATO. Is Western Europe, is the rest of NATO as concerned with this as the United States is? Well, it's not just the radars. Uh, Turkey announced today that they may be reconsidering their NATO Article 5 obligations. An attack on one is an attack on all. So this is just one indicator that Turkey is moving away from the NATO uh, family and starting to look elsewhere. And that has the Europeans more concerned than anything else. We're talking with retired Brigadier General Mark Kimmett. So, so Mark, insofar as we know, why is President, er President Erdogan doing this? It's pretty clear why President Putin of Russia would want him to do this. It gives advantage to Russia. He really gets a larger toehold in Asia Minor, as it were. But why is President Erdogan doing this? Well, he's had some concerns for years and years about the uh, European Union failing to bring Turkey into the EU. Uh, he also had some grave concerns about the United States allowing a enemy of Turkey uh, on its borders and us working alongside of those, uh, uh, those terrorists. And candidly, Putin would like to get his claws into Turkey and gain more influence. Turkey is a very, very important uh, ally of ours, has been for years and years, has the largest army uh, in Europe. Uh, and there's a lot of reasons for us to want to stay close to Turkey, but Erdogan's making it very, very hard. At the same time, our own Congress uh, is none too pleased about this. They've enacted statutes with yeah. sort of automatic sanctions, as it were, when something like this happens. Uh, it appears that the Senate's going to move forward with that. Do you expect, actually, for the U.S. to impose sanctions unless Russia takes a different path? Or, I'm sorry, Turkey takes a different path. Well, I think that's really up to President Trump. The sanctions could be voted on, but President Trump could override them with a veto. So I think it's more about the relationship between President Trump and President Erdogan than it is uh, what's happening inside the U.S. Congress. Uh, we had the ambassador, U.S. ambassador to NATO on recently, Kay Bailey Hutchinson. And Ambassador yeah. Hutchinson said that she thought that actually there still was a possibility of pulling back on the S-400 program for Turkey, that they, she had not given up on that. It seems pretty late in the game, isn't it? Well, I think that Turkey would like to see the United States in particular make some significant steps. As they said recently, they want the United States to declare the YPG, the Syrian Kurd group on their borders, a terrorist organization. Uh, there are a couple of other issues that they want some resolution on. Uh, the Gulan, who's in Pennsylvania, who's an opponent of the uh, Erdogan administration. I think he is ratcheting the issue up until the United States shows a little bit of willingness to address those issues that he has concerns about. We're talking with retired Brigadier General Mark Kimmett. So, so Mark, if you were the advisor, you were the advisor of the President of the United States right now, and your only goal, which would be U.S. national security, what would you advise him to do when it comes to Turkey? Well, I think it's time for them to meet again face-to-face. -face. <clears throat> Every time they get together, they seem to come up with some sort of agreement. But I would also try to get congressional support uh, 
for the president before he talks to Erdogan because everything he says can be undone by the United States Congress. We need to keep Turkey inside of NATO. We can't let it drift into the Russian fold. Uh, it's too important of an ally, has been for years and years. Uh, Mark, how much of this at this point is really national security concerns or even strictly speaking economic concerns? And how much of it is actually social values? Because President Erdogan has a particular set of values that may at this point increasingly align more with President Putin than it does with the West. Well, <clears throat> I, I would say that his values are still closer to the secular West than they are uh, the concerns that we have with some of the countries that we're working alongside in the Middle East. Uh, the cultural values are more Islamic that we're concerned about. His country is becoming more and more Islamic. He himself is pushing that. He's building one of the world's largest mosques right in the middle of the tourist area. So I'm less concerned about his leaning towards Russia and more uh, culturally leaning towards Iran in the Middle East. So, so finally, Mark, if you were going to guess uh, or give us at least your best estimate, how long before the S-400 system would be fully operational if they've started testing? Oh, they're testing now. I don't see it having any problems being fully operational within the next six months. So we're really up against it as a practical matter. Well, look, he can always turn it off. That's, that's the nice thing about radar systems. You can turn them on, you can turn them off. Uh, but when they start turning them on, collecting intelligence, uh, potentially having a back door in that system so that the Soviet and uh, the Russian intelligence can read it. Uh, he needs to be as concerned as anyone else. Okay, many thanks to retired Brigadier General Mark Kimmett. We're going to have much more with General Kimmett coming up in the 1 o'clock hour in Bloomberg Radio because there's an awful lot more to talk about in the region, and he knows that region particularly well. Coming up, former Latvian Prime Minister Valdis Dombrovskis was elected to a more senior position on the European Commission today, and we talked with him earlier about what's on his agenda. That's next on Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. I spoke earlier today with the newly elected Executive Vice President of the European Commission. He is Valdis Dombrovskis. And we asked him what the economic goals are for the next European Commission. If you look at the next uh, European uh, Commission, uh, we'll be, uh, and in the area of economy, we'll be dealing with a uh, green and digital transformation of EU economy. So we announced intention for Europe to become carbon neutral by 2050. We'll be uh, working on Europe fit for digital age. And when undergoing those major economic transformations, we need to ensure that we preserve our European model of social market economy and this will be also one of my tasks when uh, working on the economic and uh, social matters. And, and uh, Mr. Commissioner on the question of green particularly I know that you have said that you would like to see some reforms made within Europe that would make it easier for banks in Europe to make loans for green investments. Is that possible within your jurisdiction or does the European Central Bank has to sign off on that? Uh, well, uh, as regards uh, financing of European green transition, it must be said that it's much broader question. So we'll currently be, we'll be working on a sustainable Europe investment plan aiming to unlock uh, up to 1 trillion euros of investment over the next uh, decade. And we'll also be uh, setting the uh, right uh, regulatory framework for private finances. So we'll be working on our next sustainable finance action plan. So your question on uh, 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 providing uh, some uh, support for bank lending to green and sustainable goals like uh, green mortgages will be part of that uh, discussion. Indeed, this is one of the questions which are currently uh, putting for the preparation of the next sustainable finance action plan. As you suggest, Mr. Commissioner, this will require, this green initiative will require a fair amount of investment, uh, infrastructure investment, various sorts of investment in Europe. Is that, will that take the place of fiscal stimulus? Will that provide the fiscal stimulus that may be needed for European growth as an economy overall? 
Well, actually, we will need both uh, uh, public and uh, private investment. So uh, we are looking at what can be done, say, at the uh, EU budget level, and we are uh, proposing that there will be mainstreaming of EU budget, that 25% of the next EU budget, multi-annual EU budget, should go for the uh, sustainability goals. Uh, we'll uh, uh, work with member states that they are applying the same uh, uh, sustainable budgeting uh, principles in uh, their member states, national member states uh, budgets. Uh, we'll be working with European Investment uh, Bank to ensure that by 2025 half of its uh, uh, lending, half of its financing is uh, related uh, to uh, climate. So indeed we'll need to work both uh, with the public and uh, private uh, financing. Uh, as regards uh, uh, fiscal stimulus, of course, this is a question also of a broader uh, macroeconomic uh, picture, uh, so to balance with a uh, 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 fiscal sustainability, financial stability in member states, uh, with also uh, providing this uh, green fiscal stimulus. Uh, one of the things that has been talked about much, we hear right now actually from uh, President Macron of France, is the move toward a banking union in, in Europe. Uh, will you be taking that up? Is that achievable? Uh, and is it achievable within the next, say, six months or a year? Well, as regards uh, banking union, uh, this is an ongoing uh, initiative. Uh, already we have uh, two out of three pillars of banking union up and running. We talk about uh, single supervision and single resolution. Uh, and uh, in the next mandate, we'll be concentrating to finalize the work on the third pillar of banking union, which is a European deposit insurance uh, uh, scheme. So, uh, uh, and uh, indeed, banking union is going to be one of also next European Commission priorities. My interview with Valdis Dombrovskis. He is European Commission Vice President for Financial Services and the Euro. Coming up, fighting global hunger, hunger this Thanksgiving. How the push for food security is getting harder because of the climate change. That's coming up next. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. Tomorrow, Americans will sit down for Thanksgiving and share a meal with family and friends. But not everyone will be that lucky. Concern Worldwide is an international humanitarian organization that works with some of the world's most vulnerable people, including in the fight against global hunger. Welcome now the U.S. CEO of Concern Worldwide, Colleen Kelly, for today's Conversation in Chief. So welcome, Colleen. Good to have you here. Thank you very much. Let's start with the, the, the nature and the size of the problem. I mean, one of the things you've educated me about already is the World Hunger Index. What does that tell us? So we all know that the uh, sustainable development goals have been put in place with goals of, of, of number two of reaching zero hunger by 2030. And we have been made, making huge strides against that for years and years, but we've now kind of hit a plateau. And one of the things that's really starting to cause that to happen is, is um, more crisis and conflict and also climate change. How big a factor is climate change? We, look at, we looked at a map, actually, and a lot of the problems tend to be in sort of sub-Saharan Africa and maybe South Asia. Correct. And, you know, it's very interesting that the people who are contributing the least to climate change are actually getting impacted the most. And that's creating huge problems, as you saw in, in sub-Saharan Africa. And, for example, in the Horn of Africa, um, over the years, the once-in-a-lifetime or once-in-a-decade um, huge problems are happening now every year. The droughts are getting longer, the rains are getting shorter and more violent, causing flooding. So that not only takes away people being able to plan and to be able to um, build their, their agriculture plans and harvest, all of that's getting messed up. So it's very hard for, for people to continue. So what that does is create problems for people 
and, and insecurity and inability to feed, feed themselves, therefore kicking off more hunger events. And if you look at those areas on the map, they tend to be agrarian. They tend yeah. to sustain themselves through agriculture and obviously climate change will affect them disproportionately. How much of what concern does is addressing sort of the symptom that is getting people something to eat, which is a really yeah. good thing, yeah. as opposed to addressing the cause to get them a supply of food going forward? I mean, that's a great question because obviously prevention is way cheaper than solving the problem and way easier without people dying and all of that. So we are hugely involved in not only handling the actual emergency, but working with people to um, learn some climate smart agriculture plans, learning how to, to function in this new world that is happening. Uh, how do you get your funding? Our funding, we um, are based in Ireland. We've been about, around about 50 years. We've been in the United States 20 years. Our funding is both from uh, governments around the world, including the U.S. government, but also foundations and corporations and then individuals. So course. how do you find corporations or how do corporations find you? Well, that's a, that's a great question, too. Um, I actually was just part of a program at, at Oxford Business School addressing uh, this problem of how corporations can find and use NGOs who are the experts on the ground and need to be on the ground. And we need corporations to help scale up the efforts in the programming that we're doing. So uh, we, we're discovering that there's a, a big loss in translation with, with corporations. They want to do this. It's being pushed up from their employees, from um, trying to, to get new talent, that people are saying, are you really doing something or do you just have a traditional grant making machine. So we really want to connect with corporations and help them because they're going to need the experts on the ground, especially as we move into more conflict zones, um, harder to get places, the Central Africa Republics, the Ethiopia's um, Yemen and Syria, all of those countries. When you identify corporations to work with, do they tend to come from like food and agriculture sectors specifically or are they across the whole spectrum? That has been some of the initial corporations we've been working with. In fact, we just did a, a huge partnership with uh, Archer Daniels Midland. Obviously, they are in the food business, but they really went beyond and talked to us about the kind of programs we do and how they can help and how they can get involved. They want to make it part of their communications about what they're doing, and we hope to expand the program to talk about the future of how maybe some of their technology or innovation can help do the work we do on the ground. Now, you, you mentioned the founding of your organization. I think it came out of Biafra. It meant the original crisis in, yes. in Africa, Biafra, and, and, and as a practical matter. How much of it is really in uh, less developed countries, in developing countries, as opposed to developed countries? We have food problems here in the United States as well. We Correct. have children that go to bed hungry. Yes, well, we've always focused on the farthest behind first. It's, it's if we're going to solve world hunger, that's the way it's, it has to happen. We also are there because these places are often very insecure without governments or there's wars going on. So that is where we focus. But it is true that there is hunger all around the world. We're talking with Colleen Kelly. She's the CEO, the U.S. CEO for Concern Worldwide. And we're talking about the problem of hunger right now on the eve of Thanksgiving, not coincidentally. Yes. So many people are sitting down to a sumptuous meal and we're talking about the people who won't be. Uh, you talked about the millennial goals. How far off of those are we? It was 2030 we were supposed to eliminate hunger. How, far, how far behind are we? Well, what was amazing, we were making huge strides, and in the last year or so, some of those um, great gains have started to level off and be mitigated again by um, um, more conflict around the world and this uh, climate. And truthfully, we need corporations and foundations to come in, and corporations are going to be what helps scale up these huge programs. We're not going to be able to tackle this problem without the help of corporations. Does Concern Worldwide actually have employees that go into the location? to address this or do you work through contractors do you work with people on the ground locally uh, we have offices in all 24 of those countries and we have people oh, on do. the on the ground and we work both with international staff but a lot of national staff because you need that for the cultural and all of what we do is all about talking to the people we're trying to help to make sure we're doing the right solutions and you can't do that unless 
you know the people you're working with and what their needs are. Uh, those of us who thought at all about this problem tend to think about the World Food Program, and that's what we know that. We know that organization. How does what Concern Worldwide does, how does it fit with, for example, the World Food Program? Well, I think we are, you know, all of the different things going on, and, you know, we are often kind of the end, end game of different um, Food for Peace, World Food Pro Program. Uh, we are the guys on the ground really working with the local communities in the hardest to reach places. What's the one thing you'd most like this audience to know today about the food problem around the world? Well, that it's here. We were making great strides. We need corporations to scale up to tackle this problem. It can be done. Uh, we have the tools and know the language to use on the ground, but we uh, would like to work with corporations to help make that happen. Okay, it's really good to have you here today, Thank Colleen. Thank you so really much. Good. That's Colleen Kelly. She's the U.S. CEO for Concern Worldwide. Coming up, Balance of Power continues on Bloomberg Radio in our second hour. We're going to have more with retired Brigadier General Mark Kimmett. Plus, we have Joe Nocera of Bloomberg Opinion on why Redskins owner Dan Snyder is rolling in the dough despite his pitiful football team as we sit down to watch some Thanksgiving football games <laughs> actually coming up tomorrow. This is Balance of Power, and we are on Bloomberg Television, and we are on Bloomberg Radio.